Hello everyone, this is our third video about the antihypertensive medications. Today we're going to discuss the medications that works on the renin and angiotensin aldosterone system. So let's get started. The medications that works on the renin and angiotensin aldosterone system are classified into three classes. The first class are the direct renin inhibitors, which includes a medication like aliskyrin. The second class are the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, including captopril, enalapril, lisinopril. And the third class are the angiotensin receptor blockers, which include medications like valsartan, losartan, and candisartan. This is my very own draw of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. I hope you guys like it. So the process starts by the liver through the secretion of a substance or a peptide called angiotensinogen. Whenever you see gin at the end of a peptide, that means this peptide needs to be cleaved in order to be active. And this is exactly what happens. Angiotensinogen becomes converted into angiotensin 1 through the function of renin. Renin is an enzyme secreted by the juxta glomerular cells of the kidneys. And this works on the conversion of angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. This is where direct renin inhibitors work. They inhibit renin, so they inhibit the conversion of angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Then angiotensin 1 becomes converted into angiotensin 2 through the function of the angiotensin converting enzyme. This angiotensin converting enzyme is located in the capillaries in the lungs. And we have to memorize this one. Angiotensin converting enzyme is mainly located in the capillaries of the lungs. Angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors inhibits the angiotensin converting enzyme. So they inhibit the conversion of angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Then angiotensin 2 works on the angiotensin 2 receptors to do the following functions. It constricts the arterioles and raises the blood pressure. It constricts the efferent arteriole of the glomerulus and this leads to increase in the glomerular filtration rate. It increases aldosterone secretion leading to increased sodium and water retention. And also increases the antidiuretic hormone release which increases also the water retention. The end result of all these actions is the increase in the blood pressure. Angiotensin receptor blockers works to inhibit the receptors of angiotensin 2, which leads to the inhibition of all these actions. The juxtaglomerular apparatus is a structure in the kidney located between the afferent arteriole and the distal convoluted tubule. It consists of three types of cells. The first type is the macula densa cells, and these are located in the wall of the distal convoluted tubules. These green cells over here represents the macula densa cells in the wall of the distal convoluted tubule. The second type of cells are the juxtaglomerular cells, also known as the granule cells, and these are located in the wall of the afferent arteriole. This is the afferent arteriole, so in the wall of the afferent arteriole, these juxtaglomerular cells are located. These are the cells that secrete renin. Finally, the extraglomerular mesangial cells are modified smooth muscle cells that's located in this space here outside the glomerulus. The juxtaglomerular apparatus plays an important role in regulating the blood pressure and also regulating the filtration rate of the glomerulus. When there is low level of sodium reaching the distal convoluted tubules or there is low filtered pressure of the glomerular filtrate, this will stimulate the macula densa cells that will work on the nearby juxtaglomerular cells to secrete renin. And then the renin will initiate the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which will improve the glomerular filtration rate. It will increase the glomerular filtration rate and also will increase the blood pressure. And that's why we say the juxtaglomerular apparatus has an important role in regulating the blood pressure and also regulating the filtration rate of the glomerular. Now let's discuss the role of angiotensin 2 on the afferent and efferent arterioles of the kidney. The diameter of the afferent and efferent arteriole helps to determine the glomerular filtration rate. So let's discuss the first example. If there is a dilatation of the afferent arteriole, that means there is more blood going into the glomerular capillaries. This will increase the glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure, and this will force more fluid into the Bowman space. This in turn increases the glomerular filtration rate. Also, if there is a constriction of the efferent arteriole, that means less blood is leaving into the efferent arteriole that also increases the glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure and increases the glomerular filtration rate. Now, in the second example, if there is a constriction of the afferent arteriole, that means less blood 
is going into the glomerular capillaries. And this will in turn decrease the glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure and decrease the glomerular filtration rate. Also, if there is a dilatation of the efferent arterial, that means more blood is leaving. That, more, that means more blood is leaving into the efferent arterial. And this will in turn decrease the glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure and decrease the glomerular filtration rate. Now, angiotensin II preferentially constricts the efferent arterial more than the afferent arterial. And this is basically because the diameter of the efferent arterial is much less than the diameter of the afferent arterial. And that's why the effect of angiotensin II is more powerful on the efferent arterial. And this is beneficial because this will result in the preservation of the glomerular filtration rate as we discussed. So at low levels of angiotensin II, only the efferent arterial will constrict to maintain the glomerular filtration rate. With high levels of angiotensin II, both the efferent and afferent arterial will constrict, reducing both the renal blood flow and the glomerular filtration rate. This is what happens, for example, in cases of flight and fight. Medications of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system works on the angiotensin II levels at this stage. This will in turn result in decrease in the glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure by dilating the efferent arterial, and in that case, this will result in a decrease in the glomerular filtration rate. It's also worth mentioning that decreasing the glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure will decrease the level of translation of proteins into the Bowman space. Patients with diabetes have proteinuria. They have increased protein loss in the urine. So by decreasing the glomerular capillary hydrostatic pressure, we are decreasing the loss of these proteins in the urine. And that's why medications like ACE inhibitors are beneficial in patients with diabetic nephropathy because they will decrease the level of proteinuria in the urine. And this also will help to preserve the kidney function. This is a quick overview of the hormone aldosterone. Aldosterone is a mineral corticoid hormone secreted by the zona glomerulosa of the adrenal cortex from cholesterol. Its release is stimulated by low blood volume or pressure, high serum potassium, and this is basically the most important stimulator of aldosterone secretion, the high serum potassium, and also high levels of angiotensin II. It works on the principal cells and alpha intercalated cells of the distal convoluted tubules and the collecting ducts of the kidney. And this will result in an increase in sodium and water reabsorption. Also, it increases the potassium and acid excretion. If you want more detail about the function of aldosterone on the kidney, please refer to the video of distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct for more detailed information. The first class of medications that works on the renin and jetensin aldosterone system are the direct renin inhibitors. The most important example is Alice Chiron. They inhibit the first step in the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which is the conversion of angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1 through the inhibition of the hormone renin, which is secreted by the juxtaglomerular cells of the kidney. This is the rate limiting step of the entire process. These medications are used to treat hypertension, but their relatively new drugs are not well tested, and that's why the use of other antihypertensive medications is more advisable. The side effects of aliskyrin includes hyperkalemia because remember we are inhibiting the renin angiotensin aldosterone system so we are diminishing the effect of aldosterone. The function of aldosterone was the sodium and water retention and hydrogen ion and potassium excretion. So by inhibiting the system we are decreasing the potassium excretion and this will result in hyperkalemia. Also aliskyrin can lead to hypotension because of the same way and this hypotension can manifest with fatigue and dizziness. There is also diarrhea and abdominal pain that may happen. Aliskyrin is contraindicated in pregnant patients because this can lead to fetal malformations. It's worth mentioning that all the drugs that's working on the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and not only aliskyrin are teratogenic. So whenever possible, we should stop taking any medications that has to do with the renin angiotensin aldosterone system for pregnant patients. The second class of medications that works on the renin angiotensin aldosterone system are the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or ACE inhibitors. This inhibits the activity of the angiotensin converting enzyme. Remember the angiotensin converting enzyme was located in the capillaries of the lung. Yes. 
So this will eventually cause decrease in the total peripheral resistance by causing vascular smooth muscle relaxation because remember, angiotensin is a potent vasoconstrictor. So by inhibiting the synthesis of angiotensin 2, we are lowering the total peripheral resistance. There is also a decrease in the blood volume through the inhibition of secretion of aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone. All of that will lead to decrease in blood pressure and myocardial oxygen demands. There is a very important point that we always have to keep in mind. Angiotensin converting enzyme hydrolyzes bradykinin and bradykinin is a potent vasodilator. So by inhibiting the angiotensin converting enzyme, this will result in the increased level of bradykinin. Actually, since bradykinin is a potent vasodilator, this can be synergistic in lowering the blood pressure. But also at the same time, this explains some of the side effects of ACE inhibitors like cough and angioedema. The uses of ACE inhibitors includes hypertension, either alone or in combination with other antihypertensive medications. Also, ACE inhibitors can be used in acute myocardial infarction, which means the first 24 to 36 hours post-infarction. And why? Because the use of ACE inhibitors decreases the infarction size and prevents the pathological cardiac remodeling. And this is thought to be due to the effect of bradykinin, which dilates the coronary, so bringing more blood to the heart, and also has anti-growth effect, so prevents the scarring of the myocardial tissue. Also, ACE inhibitors can be used in heart failure because they decrease the total peripheral resistance and the afterload. So this will decrease the myocardial work rate, and decreasing the myocardial work rate will decrease the myocardial oxygen demand. So this will help the diseased heart. Also, ACE inhibitors can be used in diabetic nephropathy because they decrease the intraglomerular pressure, as we discussed earlier, and this will decrease the hyperfiltration of proteins. Finally, ACE inhibitors can be used in chronic renal failure, and I mean here not the totally decompensated chronic renal failure, I mean the compensated chronic renal failure. The side effects of ACE inhibitors include hypotension, which can manifest as dizziness, fatigue, and fainting. Also, ACE inhibitors can cause hyperkalemia because of the decreased level of aldosterone. If you remember, aldosterone decreases the serum potassium level. So if we are decreasing the aldosterone level, we are increasing the serum potassium level. These last three side effects are thought to be due to the high levels of bradykinin caused by the ACE inhibitors. This includes skin itching and rash, cough, and angioedema. Patients who are intolerant to cough sometimes are switched to angiotensin receptor blockers. ACE inhibitors are contraindicated with pre-renal causes of renal failure, things like bilateral renal artery stenosis, severe heart failure, and dehydration. And this is because all these conditions reduces the blood flow to the kidney. So now the glomerular filtration rate is now totally dependent on the efferent arterial constriction to maintain the glomerular filtration rate. Now if we cause efferent arterial dilatation by ACE inhibitors, what's going to happen? we can massively reduce the glomerular filtration rate and cause acute renal failure. So in these conditions, we should never use ACE inhibitors. If a patient has unilateral, not bilateral renal artery stenosis, we can still use ACE inhibitors. But bilateral renal artery stenosis, we should never use ACE inhibitors. Concomitant use with NSAIDs and ACE inhibitors is not really advised. And this is because NSAIDs decreases prostaglandin levels. And what does prostaglandins do? Prostaglandins dilates the afferent arterial. That way it maintains or increases the renal blood flow. So with the NSAIDs that causes decrease in the prostaglandins and that means decrease in the renal blood flow and also the ACE inhibitors that causes efferent arterial constriction, this will result also in massive reduction in glomerular filtration rate and in that case we can precipitate acute renal failure. So remember this again, you should not use NSAIDs and ACE inhibitors together. Also, high potassium diet is not advised with these patients because they already have some kind of hyperkalemia. The use of ACE inhibitors is contraindicated during pregnancy because ACE inhibitors decreases the fetal urine production and this can result in oligohydramnios and potter sequence. Remember, we already said in general, all the medications that work on the renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone system are contraindicated during pregnancy. Also, ACE inhibitors are contraindicated if there is hypersensitivity to the ACE inhibitors.
Finally, let's briefly discuss the angiotensin receptor blockers. These are medications that block the angiotensin 2 receptors. They reduce the blood pressure by blocking the arteriolar constriction and also reducing the salt and water retention. Pretty much the same effect as the ACE inhibitors, but just they block the receptors, not the angiotensin converting enzyme itself. They also prevent the cardiac reperfusion injury following myocardial infarction. They are used mainly in hypertension when patients cannot tolerate the ACE inhibitors, like for side effects like cough and angioedema. So the first line is the ACE inhibitors. If the patient cannot tolerate ACE inhibitors, we can use angiotensin receptor blockers. You should not start with the angiotensin receptor blockers though. Start first with the ACE inhibitors. If there is side effects, switch to the angiotensin receptor blockers. The reason why angiotensin receptor blockers does not cause side effects like cough and angioedema as ACE inhibitors is because they do not block the breakdown of bradykinin because they don't have effect on the angiotensin converting enzyme. Also, angiotensin receptor blockers can be used in heart failure, myocardial infarction, and diabetic nephropathy, just as the ACE inhibitors. Angiotensin receptor blockers pretty much have the same side effects and contraindications like ACE inhibitors. The only difference is that they do not cause cough and they do not cause angioedema, and this is because they do not affect the bradykinin levels. So they do cause hyperkalemia, hypotension, headache, and dizziness, and they are also contraindicated during pregnancy. This is the end of the video. Thank you everyone for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and check our Facebook page. See you next time.